Welcome to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Hey everyone, it's Jenny Lisk and this is episode 90 of the Widowed Parent Podcast. So I'm very excited to bring you this discussion this week for the second week of Uh, Children's Grief Awareness Month. It happens in November every year. And last week I had such a great discussion with the teenage founder of a website called Teenage Grief Sucks. So do check that out if you missed last week. Uh, But this week, before we get to the guest, I got to tell you guys, um, very, very exciting news. My um, my memoir, it's called Future Widow, uh, Losing My Husband, Saving My Family and Finding My Voice is coming out very, very soon. It's actually under two months away. The 5th of January is launch day. And it is now available for pre-order on Amazon.com. And so you can find it if you go to futurewidowbook.com. You can find all the links. And actually, uh, you can pre-order right now the Kindle version only. It will be available in paperback and hardcover. And those I expect to have ready around the first week in January to be ordered. Um, But for now, if you were planning to read the Kindle version, or if you like to read your books that way, you can definitely pre-order that on Amazon. And the other thing is, um, because we can't do the pre-order now, I wanted to set up kind of a fun way to uh, both let people know when the paperback will be ready, but also to get a... uh, like a free signed copy, in a sense. Uh, I'm set up a a free um, book plates that I will sign and mail to you and personalize it. And uh, it's kind of like having a signed copy of the book. So if you go to futurewidowbook.com, there's a a button where you can request a book plate. And and like I said, then I'll let you know um, as soon as it's ready for the paperback and the hardback are ready to be ordered. So I hope you'll check that out. And... uh, do uh, keep an eye on social media. I'm starting to do the publicity and get the word out now. I'm starting to share some quotes from the book. So it's all it's all very exciting. It's taking shape. It's uh, I've been working on the final formatting of the print version, and it's looking like a real book. So I uh, can't wait to share it with you guys. So just wanted to give you a quick update on that. And now let's move on to today's guest. The Widowed Parent Podcast is supported by Audible, and I'm excited to say that listeners can get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial. Just go to audibletrial.com slash widowedparent. That's audibletrial.com slash widowedparent, and you get a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial of Audible. I hope you'll check it out. I had such a great discussion with Marnie williams Belotus for this episode. And Marnie is a widowed parent, and she is the co-founder and executive director of Hummingbird Center for Hope, which is in the Toronto area in Canada. And I talked with Marnie back in March. It was actually the first pandemic special episode that I did, and I've been wanting to have her back on the show to talk with her some more. And we cover a point that I think is especially important, and that is this topic of kids grieving, re-grieving as they move through developmental milestones. And as you'll hear, Marnie's kids were very young when her husband died, and so she had pretty much all of those developmental milestones ahead of her. And so we really dive deep on how that looked for her kids as they got older, as they got to be, you know, 6 and 10 and 14. Um, and also the differences between, you know, if you have more than one child, you likely have more than one set of needs or grief experiences. So really, I think a very interesting and, and useful, I hope you'll find uh, discussion. So um, I hope you enjoy my discussion with Marnie williams Belotus. My guest today is Marnie williams Belotus. Marnie is the co-founder and executive director of Hummingbird Center for Hope, and she is also a widowed parent herself. She's joining us today from the Toronto, Canada area. Marnie, welcome to the show. Hi, Jenny. Thanks for having me. Yeah, actually, I should have said welcome back to the show. I've been looking forward to speaking you again to you again. Um, you were, of course, on episode, I had to look it up, it was 59, way back in March, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was the very first pandemic special episode that I recorded. 
um, and you were kind enough to hop on and, and talk about that. So I'll put a link in the show notes um, for listeners if they want to go back and check that out. Um, Good. Yeah. And so, but at the time I said, I want to have you back on the show to hear about your journey and Hummingbird Center for Hope and the resources you guys have and your experience as a widowed parent. So thank you for coming back for this. Uh, this actually is going to be the second episode of Children's Grief Awareness Month this year. So um, mm-hmm. it's great to have you back. Yeah. We're happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So let's just, uh, let's jump right in here. Um, can you just back way up back to, you know, normal life before everything changed? What was your life like before your husband died? Um, well, life was good and, and it feels like it was years ago. He, he died 18 years ago, so it has been a while, but, um, life was good. We were trying to, you know, establish ourselves as a new couple. Um, we had, uh, a young family. We had our son, Scott. And then I was pregnant with my daughter, I think when he started to get sick, but you know, it was good. It was easy. It was who knew what the future would have to hold. So um, yeah. nothing to complain about. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so then everything changed. So you said your husband got sick. How long was he sick for? Um, from diagnosis to death, it was six weeks. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Which was a bit of a, a bit of a roller coaster to say the least. Um, I think while I was pregnant, he, the cancer was starting to take over, but he was diagnosed six weeks after my daughter was born. He went into the hospital and he'd been having some health issues and he checked himself into the emergency room. And I remember him calling me to tell me that this is what he had done. And I was joking with him. I'm like, get yourself out of there. You're not, you're not an emergency. Like we had, I think we had a doctor's appointment coming up and you know, you're wasting, you're wasting the ER time. Um, mm. but he stuck around and, and, uh, the doctor that saw him obviously recognized that something was wrong and had us back in a couple of days later. And from the word go, it was terminal three to six months to live and go on vacation, like wrap it up and go on vacation was how it all started. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, Wait, he wicked. said, he said, you're going to die in three to six months. You better go on vacation now. Well, stop work, do what you want to do kind of concept. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, wow. You know, there's, yeah. So, and then I laughed too, because they gave us a big bottle of morphine and sort of told us, you know, don't tell anybody you have it, but never mm-hmm. really told me how much I could give them safely. Like it was, it was very weird. Hmm. Um, and then to have the six week old baby in my arms. Um, yeah. It just didn't, <clears throat> doesn't compute in your head, right? This isn't supposed right. to happen. Yeah. Plus so you had a three-year-old also. Yeah. He was at, <laughs> he was at home with the grandparents while we were getting this this devastating news and and yeah like like I said the cancer was so so brutal and so aggressive that six weeks later he died in the in the emergency room we never Mm. never really got to my goal was six months and clearly we never got there the cancer had a different plan for us than we did yeah Mm -hmm. did you ever get that trip (laughs) we did a uh we did like a two nighter at, at some friends in the in the Rocky Mountains, but I uh, was not a vacation by any uh, stretch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was yeah. an endurance test for me. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for telling us about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then you are a widowed mom with a three month old and a three year old. So what were those early months like, or the first year, whatever the early period, however you define that? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's. Some days I'm not even entirely sure what we did that first, that first year was definitely just my focus was on the kids to make sure that, that they were going to be okay. That, um, and probably more so my son, because, you know, he could walk and talk and do all that stuff. My daughter just needed those basic, you know, needed love, needed to be fed, needed to be changed and bathed. Her needs were just as demanding, but not around the grief side of it. Whereas for Mm. my son, it was more questions of where's daddy, what happened, trying to explain that, um, that concept of death to him and holding his emotions and and parenting him. So um, I laugh because I tell people now, you know, as long as you're feeding your kids, it's okay. It doesn't matter what you're feeding them, feed them. And (laughs) when I first said that, I looked back on that first year and my son was allergic to dairy, um, so cheese and stuff like that wasn't wasn't an option. 
And I joke, like, feed them KD for a week. Like, it doesn't matter. You're feeding them. It's okay. And when I went home and thought KD? about it, I'm like, Wait. oh, sorry, craft dinner. Oh, oh, that's <laughs> like macaroni and cheese. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's funny. <laughs> Cross the border differences. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have yeah, heard like, of craft dinner, but I haven't heard of KD. So <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you guys. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. That's funny. Um so the joke was, you know, feed them this craft dinner, this processed, um, vibrant orange craft dinner, and, and it'll all be fine. Like, feed them. And uh -huh. afterwards, when I went home, I was like, what did I feed my three-year-old that first year? Because he couldn't do craft dinner because he was allergic to dairy. Oh, yeah. So I have no idea what I fed him for that first year. Uh -huh. So, I, And I think that speaks volumes as to where that grief brain takes you that... Mm those are the details you don't remember you don't worry about well I guess I'm worried about it but there's just no knowledge of it right like I have no idea Zip, right zilch. right um, so that I think that explains how my first year went <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I don't know well, <laughs> yeah I imagine sometimes I hear you know the kids in that three-year-old age range or whatever because of the idea that you know they don't understand the permanence of death and things like that sometimes parents have to explain over and over and over and over again like yeah. you know why isn't daddy coming home or what does mm -hmm. dead mean or whatever like and yeah. maybe as a parent you're I imagine that must be difficult it's exhausting I, I compare it now to so my son would ask me multiple times a day where's daddy when's he coming home and every time he asks that question and you have to answer that he's not coming home that he's died it's gut wrenching for us parents, right? Because yeah. those are words that three year olds shouldn't have to know unless it's relating to their fish or their hamster or something, right? Like not their right. parent. And the way I sort of look at it now is you remember how many times you had to t tell your kid how to count to 10 or recite the alphabet before mm. they got it correctly. Mm. Now we're trying to explain that concept of death and that finality and that never coming back to a three year old, you have to explain it at least a million times before it starts to sink in. Right. And it's the last thing as a parent that you want to do. Like I didn't want to tell my kid anymore that his dad wasn't coming home, that his dad had died and what that meant. Cause it was too hard for me to even process that. Right. 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 Because this is happening when you're devastated and you're in your early grief and you're mm -hmm. having to say a million times over and over again, dad died. Dad's not coming back Yeah. over and over. Yeah. And I st was still waiting for him to come home too. So, yeah, <laughs> was, you know, I still had that, that denial part, right. That, you know, if I wake up, maybe this will all be a bad dream or, you know, he is going to come home tonight, the door will open and, and in he'll walk. Mm -hmm. So it was as much as explaining it to, to my son that he can't come home. It was also explaining it to myself at the same time. And it was not, I, ugh, I hated the conversation. Like I didn't want to tell him anymore. And I know I would get frustrated and angry by his repetition in the questions, but being a little farther out, that's what he needed to do. He needed to ask those questions. He needed to learn how to count to 10 again, right? And mm. Put mm. four and five in the right order. And it was, it was brutal, brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. looking back now, like when you have families that come into your program with kids in that age group, I mean, what do you tell them? Just like take a deep breath and come up with a mantra that you're going to repeat or what, how do you advise people to handle that? Yeah, it, it is a mantra. I always, I'm always about scripting your lines. So being able to, because with, with kids and it doesn't matter what age they're at, you got to speak in their, their understanding and their, and their language. So talking to a three-year-old is very different than talking to a 15 year old and the words that you use are very different. So <clears throat> having that scripted line in your head that, you know, no, daddy can't come home because he died. And then died means that he can't use the cell phone. He can't go for a walk with you. And if I knew how to respond, then I, then it was a little better. If, you know, if a new question came in, like he asked me something different, it would be like, uh, I, I, I'm not ready for that one. Give me uh -huh. a minute. Uh -huh. So the more we can script ourselves and be prepared as a parent, I think the better we can handle our grief on answering those questions because mm. yeah it is repetition for sure and yeah yeah making it as easy on yourself as you can while supporting your kid mm. mm -hmm. yeah finding that balance yeah okay I think that's helpful um so this is leading me to think then because you mentioned it was I think 18 years ago so your kids now must be 
I don't know, 18, 21, something like that. You got it. Good math. <laughs> Should I do the math in my head real quick here. <laughs> yep. So, okay. So this makes me think of this concept then of um, children and teenagers developmental milestones and how grief intersects with that whole process. Because as you said, so your kids were, one was an infant and one was three. Mm-hmm. So you had all those developmental milestones ahead of you. Yeah. I guess you tired. I had all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah. Like, like I said, I think I had all of them be- between the two of them, but as, as they got older and understood a bit more, I guess the impact of, of what it means to have your parent die, their questions would change. They would, um, I'll speak from my son's side where he would ask me more detailed questions about what happened. He would want to hear more stories of, of Keith as a, as a parent, because he doesn't, he doesn't remember him. He's got like one, one story that is truly his. And then these little bits and pieces that I've expanded the story around. Sure. So even though he's three, he doesn't, doesn't have much um, about his dad. So you know, we would be having these conversations. Some of them are spontaneous that, you know, you just start talking and the conversation shifts and now you're talking about dad or the cancer or whatever happened. Hmm. And, you know, at three, it was dad can't, when you're dead, you can't use the phone. And he died of cancer. When it was six, he died of esophageal cancer. When he was 12, you know, the cancer had metastasized. So the story changes and evolves. And his his understanding of it and his um even his need to to share and to and to give back sort of changes over time as well like he and his need to tell his story so in grade five he did a project and he talked about his dead dad and um you know some of his english writings the that topic would sort of come in in an underlying message so i think that was the ways he um processed it and and I guess journaled it, so to speak, right? In a in an educational side. Um, so yeah, that's you know now that he's twenty one, and you know when he graduated from high school, I remember that was a big day more so for me than I think for him on the grief side of it, right? That realization of you know dad should be here to mm. see this, but also for me being very grateful of where we are and that he is actually walking across the stage, and I did feed him in that first year, so. <laughs> Uh-huh. Get us here, but his grief, I think, was a little bit more, um, more in the in that first year was really intense. Those really big conversations, those really big emotions. Those, you know, he could drop me like a hot potato with his comments um, in those first couple of years, and then I think he started to internalize it a little bit. And it's, I think, for him, it's been a bit more just that underlying. It's it's part of his story, but it's not so much upfront. Mm. Um, whereas my daughter, it's more upfront, like she happily shares it and um, talks about it and makes, she wants people to know that this is part of her story. Mm. So that's the difference. Yeah. So she was three months old. So um, at some point she had to come to understand that she even had a dad who died. Mm -hmm. Like that seems like, like your son, even if he didn't understand the permanence and all that stuff, like when he was three, he knew his dad was here yesterday and now he's not here today. But your daughter, yeah. I don't know if she, like in those early days, probably didn't really know as long as someone was feeding her. <laughs> Definitely. Right. It started to happen when she got into preschool, right? Where they, you know, the, the no fault on the teachers, but draw a picture of your family. Uh, right. And, yeah. or dad would, or, or a dad would come and pick up her classmate and, you know, she didn't have that male figure as a dad in her life, her grandparents were very big in her life. So she had that part of it, but they weren't the ones picking up, picking her up Mm. in preschool. Mm. And I think that's, I remember going to the preschool teacher because she had drawn this picture of the full family. And I just went to the preschool teacher, just, you know, and this was three years later. So I'm very easy to talk about my grief at that point and said, just so you know, in case it comes up, like her dad has died. And you know, this, the family that she drew is her family because she always has a dad. Um, but just in case it comes up, I want you to know this is the re- this, you know, mm. she's not making up a story at three years old, right? 
So, so the picture, there would be no indication from the picture that her father had died. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It looked like a typical family shot, right? Where, right. Um, you know, mom, dad, or brother and, and me. Right. And so that, that preschool was sort of that time where that, the, the, the realness of this dad figure, right? Other kids have this dad figure. Why don't I? Right. Mm. Why is mine only in photos where this one shows up and picks me up from mm. or picks a friend out from daycare. Right. Yeah. So that, that change started to happen. And I think that's when she started to realize that her family looked different. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I always told her that, you know, you do have a dad. He's just not physically here. Right. 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 So yep. She was very aware of who he was, but couldn't touch him. Right. Right. So um, and then as she got older, um, one of the big things for her was she wanted to have this relationship with this. She eventually calls him like an imagine, imaginary figure. Hmm. She wants to have a relationship with him because she knows nothing about him. Like, mm-hmm. or not to her level of understanding. She knows about him because I've shared and we've talked and, and the extended family has talked about it. But she felt like she was missing Something like a like that personal, right? personal yeah. relationship of some sort. Yeah. The stories mm-hmm. weren't cutting it for her the way she wanted it to. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, so what did you do? So, <laughs> um, so it's funny how timing in life um, just magically happens. So she had started to, so when she was about 10 years old, she started to get heavy into her grief. And I sort of coined it that, her at 10 years old was like me at three, at three months into my grief. Ah. Except she was having it 10 years later. Right. Mm-hmm. And yep. I had to go back 10 years. That, does that so make she, sense? Yeah. She was having like new grief as a 10 year old. Yeah. Probably yeah. because of her new levels of ability to understand. Yeah. I think this is when it really started to, to make sense to her and bubble up for her. Her, she was ready for it. Right. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, but she, you know, she got, she was emotional. She was asking those big questions. So it made me as mom have to go back into my grief and bring up stuff that it didn't necessarily want to do a decade um, later. Yeah. 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 But you know, she's my girl. So off we go. And, and that's uh-huh. what we did. so she had started making waves about wanting to go back to Calgary because that's where we lived um, in Alberta when he died and where she was born, everything happened there. So she started to okay. make these waves about wanting to go back. Um, again, the world finally, you know, the moon's all align and uh, I was able to take her back for her 14th birthday. So mm-hmm. it took me four years to pull, <laughs> to pull this together, but I call it, um, it's the trip where I took her to meet her dead dad is, is what I call the trip, which uh-huh. anybody outside of this podcast will probably think I'm completely nuts. <laughs> And people listening probably think it makes perfect sense. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're with me. Uh-huh. Um, so we went back to Calgary for an entire week. It was just her and I. Um, we went, I took her to the old house. I even debated knocking on the door and asking if I could go in, but I didn't. That was, uh-huh. I thought that was too much, but we drove, drove, sat in front of the, the old house. We went to where we got married. We went to where we were engaged. We went to where um, she saw the hospitals where where her brother was born and where her dad died. We went out to like Louise, um, met some, met some of his friends and I had them share stories. We, um, so after Keith died, um, I don't know, five, seven years later, our dog died and I had him cremated Mm. and I kept the ashes. Um, actually somehow back then I knew I wanted to do this to take the kids back to the river where I scattered Keith's ashes was to have the dog join Keith and have the kids scatter it as, as um, mm. something for them. So because we, the, you scattered the ashes like early on. So they weren't old enough to really be part of that. Hit no, it Keith's was just ashes. me that, yeah, okay, I was right. the only one that did that. Okay. Um, so to, we packed half the dog with us on this flight too. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy gun. Uh-huh. Um, and part of it was to go back to that spot and um and I made it all for her. Like I said, you do whatever you need. She wanted to buy roses. We took some food. We like I had the whole day put like 
scheduled for her. I, and when we got to the spot, I just said, I'm going to sit here. You do whatever you need. You take as long as you want. I'm comfortable. I will just, I will just be, and uh, you do what you need to do. And eventually we'll scatter the dog where, where we scattered your dad. Here's another hmm. weird sentence. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes, I think so. But, yes. but again, in this context it makes perfect sense. Yes. Um, so we were there for about three hours and, and she eventually did it. And it was, it was awesome. It was amazing to see her. And so there's a, a gentleman by the name of Alan Wolfelt, who um, is a thanatologist out of Colorado. He does all sorts of stuff and an expert in, in grief. And one of his lines is, you have to say hello before you can say goodbye. Hmm. And what, what he means by that is even like at the, at the funeral, like he encourages people to have an, an open casket and go up and say hello to your deceased person. And I think it's part of it is to help you realize, okay, that this did happen, right? We know hmm. that our brains, our brains take a while to catch up on that. So by going up and saying hello, then you can start your grief is sort of his, his concept. Hmm. Well, when we walked into the river Valley, it took us a while to find it. The terrain had changed over 14 years. So hmm. <laughs> it was a little bit exciting to get in, hmm. but as we were walking in, she was dropping off rose petals along the path. It was, you know, just this nice moment. And, and then again, she was there for about three hours doing whatever she needed to do. It was her saying hello. And when we left and walked back off, the, like back to the car, she like floated. Like there was this weight that had been lifted off of her and she like mm. floated out of the, out of the woods and back into the car. And I realized that was her saying hello. Mm. And now she could start working on saying this goodbye concept. It was, oh. it was, oh, there, there's, <laughs> It floors me every time that I think about it because of just the magic that happened at that river valley with, with her and, and what we went through or what she went through and, and connecting with them. I think she felt, she felt him there, which I think was really, really important for her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how, I was just thinking how powerful to realize as a three month old, she hadn't really said hello to her dad. Yeah. And, and yeah. she lost him. So, Yeah. Yeah. And I never would have put that together. Like she did actually come with me when I scattered the ashes only because she was three months and somehow I managed to continue breastfeeding through it all. So she needed me. Right, <laughs> I didn't right. need her at the time. She needed me. Right. So she was there when I originally did it. And she likes that fact that, that she was there, even though she was three months and has got has yeah. no recollection. And then to take her back and do, and do this with, granted it's the dog, but it's that same same connection yeah. she did have a relationship with the dog like she knew right you know she was much older when when he died so it was the trip was phenomenal as a parent it was completely exhausting because I hadn't been back to that spot I hadn't been back to the spot where we were married I hadn't shared a lot of those stories that or forgotten about some of them that these friends were telling us like it was I was done when I came back but mm. she she was energized she was she was ready to go <laughs> I was ready for a nap. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and again, this now is 14 years for you after your initial early grief. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. It was a neat, it was a really, really neat experience. And, um, you know, I'm glad that the world did align and allow us to do it. Like she even, we had her birthday when we were there too. And, and just some cool things happened where, you know, if you believe in the spiritual stuff or those little signs and, and uh, acknowledgements from, from your people that, you know, we had some of that stuff happen and, and she was old enough to, to get it, to be open to it, to, to have conversations about it. Like if, if I had done it when she was eight, I don't think we would have gotten the same thing mm -hmm. out of it or done it when she was 17. Well, pandemic rolled in and that wouldn't have happened. So <laughs> It was just this perfect little magical time that just happened. And, yeah. and it was really neat. Like I got yeah. pictures of her where Keith was like, so um, yeah, it was a big, big week. Big. Week. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what a wonderful idea and what a wonderful gift for you to, to do that for her and with her um, and mm. drag yourself back through things that, 
you know, didn't necessarily want to drag back through. Um, but for her sake, if, if, um, is there anything that, you know, if someone's listening to the story and thinking that's a good idea, any maybe advice of maybe something you wish you'd done differently or something, you know, somebody to take into account some things that, that uh, they might not realize ahead of time? Um, as a parent, you really have to prep yourself. Like I went and did some counseling before I went just to make sure that, that I could be there. Cause mm. it was like seven days, 24 hours a day of grief. Like mm. there was no, there wasn't really a break. If she had an emotional moment, it was there. If I had one, it was there. Like it was, you know, we didn't do much sightseeing. We did. We walked where Keith walked. We went to all those places. So I somehow had the awareness that I needed to make sure I was in a good spot to go and, and prepped for it because even though I did that, it was still way bigger than, than what I anticipated it was going to be. So mm. the before and the after, um, as much as planning the trip, you got to plan the before and the after to make sure that you as a parent can take care of yourself, um, be in that spot with your kid, and and then even to take care of yourself and take care of your kid afterwards because we bubbled all sorts of things that that needed support when we got back, right? You don't get off the plane and dust yourself off and keep going. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> nope, we just, we stirred the pot and now we need to figure out what to do with, with everything that we brought up. So yeah. Um, I think that's the biggest part is just, you know, the impact of it, like both the good and the bad, right? Like that it was mm -hmm. an awesome experience, but we also need to make sure you're okay and the kids are okay. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Be my words of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, it sounds like um, this was just you and your daughter and your son did not come along on the trip. Yeah. So I didn't take him because their grief is very different, right? And what what each of them needs is um, is unique. And if I had taken them both at the same time, then neither one of them would have gotten what they needed mm. out of the trip. And what my daughter needed was very more detailed. Um, and I have every plan of taking my son. I still have half the dog with me, so <laughs> still there. Uh -huh. um, so I still have every plan to take my son, but what he wants to do is different than than what she wants to do. So, um, and because of that, it, it does require the two trips, right? Like I can't assume that both of them need the exact same thing from me in regards to their grief because they don't, they're, mm. they're unique individuals and, and their relationship with their parent is very different. So I need to honor that and do what each one needs for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, good. Thank you for articulating that because I think that's, it's not something that was immediately obvious to me, for example, like early on in grief, you tend to think, okay, you know, the kids, quote unquote, now I'm doing air quotes, listeners can't mm -hmm. see that, uh, you know, the kids should do this or need that or whatever, and that it's not necessarily, you can't necessarily lump them all together and assume they need or want the same things for all kinds of reasons, age, personality, relationship to the person who died, all kinds of, all kinds of reasons why they might need different things. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get them the same Christmas presents, so they don't need the same, you know, their needs and wants are very different. And we need mm -hmm. to, I think that's what makes widowed parenting so hard is that each kid does it differently and needs you at different times for different things. And, you know, you sort of get one settled and then the other one bubbles up or, you know, somebody asks you this question and the other one doesn't want to talk about it. Like it's, um, it would be fantastic if they all did it the same way, same time. Like that would be a dream come true. But yeah. It's anything yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Well, I think that's that's a very important point. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I did want to ask you, uh, shifting gears, I guess, a little bit. Um, you, sometime after your husband died, uh, started a grief center. Mm -hmm. Can you tell yeah. us about that? Why did you, what led you to do that? Um, so we started an organization called the Hummingbird Center for Hope, and it's specific to widowed parents. When, when Keith died, I did join a support group about three months after, after his death. Um, and it was called the Under 40 Spousal Loss Group, which has this lovely romantic name that <laughs> I wanted nothing to do with. Uh, uh. Um, so I did find people that were closer to me. Like some had families, some didn't. But we were all sort of that younger demographic. 
Um, but it was six weeks and some of us stuck together afterwards. And then, and then that was that. And then I moved from Calgary to Ontario and the support group that I joined in Ontario, I was the youngest by about three decades. And, oh boy. you know, I don't minimize anybody's grief, but an 80 year old's grief is very different than a 35 year old grief. Right. And, and mm-hmm. it just is, it's no better, no worse. It just is. Um, and then I also realized that because of the kids, our grief is carried very differently and for a longer time because, you know, 10 years down the road, I'm taking my daughter to meet her dead dad. Well, I need help. I need support. I need, you know, encouragement. So Hummingbird's about supporting parents, no matter where they're at, you can come to us three days into your grief and you can come to us 10 years down the road in your grief. And, and we're building that community and supporting and, and, um, and helping you parent your kids, right? Helping you with that part of it. Mm-hmm. And it was because we couldn't, f- I couldn't find it when, when I needed it. Mm-hmm. Terrific. So, yeah. So you just said, I'll just start a grief center. <laughs> was this your, were you in this world before or you were in a different world, like job wise? Um, so when Keith died, I was, well, I was just, just a mom when Keith died. Um, but I worked at the ski hill in Lake Louise and did inventory, food and beverage inventory control. Um, so very, very different. So that sounds like uh-huh. a, like an accountant or something. Um, no, it was inventory. Well, I guess numbers. Oh. Yeah. So, um, pretty dry. Don't tell my boss that, but <laughs> 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 dry. it was fun, but it wasn't the long term. And then through my experience and that needed support, um, something, some seed planted in me that, you know, I want to be able to give back when I can. And so I've been helping um, bereaved people for 16 years, but the Hummingbird Center, we started um, about eight years in. So I've been doing this for a long time, but um, the center, again, was is about eight years of just specific for widowed parents. So mm-hmm. it's, Terrific. Uh, well, and yeah. widowed parents, okay, so, and do you have groups and stuff for children too, or just for the parents? Um, more so just for the parents. Gotcha. We, okay. We know that how a parent grieves has a direct impact on how the kid grieves. Mm. So we want to support the parents, give them the tools, build their community, have those people that they can lean on, cry on, you know, be understand the weird sentences that I just said in this past, <laughs> the past <laughs> few and, uh-huh. and you know, not be judged, um, but to help them help their kids. So if the parent is is strong and has the tools, then that filters down to our kids, and we can help them grieve and be there for them in a different way so we do more family stuff where both parent and kid can come um, and share their grief we do some creative stuff or just you know we went swimming this summer brought everybody into the pool and just had some fun and Mm -hmm. um, so it's a combination of both of that Mm -hmm. terrific Mm -hmm. and you have some virtual groups i think too right even before the pandemic you were doing some virtual things yeah, we were Zooming before the pandemic brought Zoom into the dictionary. <laughs> um, so right now we have two different, um, and again, doing it beforehand, but we have two different groups. One is specific for our widowed dads. Um, I think it's important that they have dads just to, or other men just to talk to. So they meet once a month on the third Wednesday. And then since the pandemic, we've increased our, our regular virtual support that's open to both moms and dads. And we actually have four dads that, that join in on us every week. Um, so it happens right. weekly on Thursday nights. Um, mm. And some days I'll have 20 people on the, in the group. And we, you know, we have a, a topic for each night, a little bit of education and then sharing and, and venting as needed. And um but just with the with the change in the world, we needed to be able to parents needed someone to lean on and, and to be able to chat to because the world was, you know, that social circle changed um, since yeah. March. So we wanted to be able to increase it in a way that we could. So, right. And so are these groups just for people in Toronto or just for people in Canada or who is it open to? Uh, North America, um, ultimately, but virtual has certainly expanded the if you're willing to do the time zone, we're in. We're in Toronto, so Eastern Eastern time zone. If you're willing to work around that, we're willing to have you. So um, we've had people from the West Coast join in. And, um, but yeah, virtual's expanded the reach so we can help more. Yeah. So is it about, about 7 p.m. or something Eastern time? Yeah, 7 to 8.30. Both the dads and the, and the regular group is 7 to 8.30 uh, Eastern time. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that could be feasible for potentially lots of people, depending on where they are. 
Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. West Coast, it's what, 4.30 or something like that. So it's not too bad. Doable. So, yeah, 7 o'clock, 4 o'clock. Yeah, I'm on the yeah. West Coast. So yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and I worked I worked East Coast hours for many years. So I have that, that conversion in my head just, you know, right off the top of my yeah. head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, well, good. Well, I'll make sure to put a link in the show notes to your groups and how people can sign up for them because um, I do think that's a terrific resource and, you know, feeling, you're connecting with other people who are in a similar situation of being you know, widowed with kids mm-hmm. or a widowed dad with kids in the case of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe everyone's stories are a little different, but there's so much in common that we can share. Yeah. How you got to the, to be a widowed parent doesn't, I say this with love, doesn't matter. But now that you're here, let's, let's embrace you and let's, you know, support you as we can. And it doesn't matter how they, how your person died, you you come, we're here. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Terrific. Okay, Mm -hmm. good. Um, So, and then shifting gears again a little bit, I noticed that you have contributed a chapter to a book that's coming out. Can you tell us about that? Yes, it's, uh, it's kind of exciting. Um, so it's called The Great Canadian Women, and it's um, it's only open to Canadian women. Sorry about that for the rest of your viewers. <laughs> but, um, they, so it's eight, 18 or 19 women that have come together um, through this organization, The Great Canadian Women. And uh, it's a chapter about, um, for me, it's about widowed parenting. And it's about um, my focus is on when my son graduated from high school and the impact and the realization and, and how my grief bubbled and, and how the past, um, at that point, 15 years had had unfolded. Um, so that's what my chapter is about. But the other ladies, it's any any struggle that they've had in their life that they're willing to share. And it's, so it's a collection of these stories and it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. People are actually buying it from me, which I think is the most awesome Ah, part. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) That's, that's terrific. Yeah. Is it, um, is there a link that I can share? Is it on Amazon or is it like, how can people, if they want to check it out? Um, It is going to be on, uh, on Amazon. The pre-sales are closing today. So that doesn't do much good for when this goes out. Um, You can connect with me and I can certainly, forward you on or it will be on Amazon and it's under the the great Canadian woman is what you'd be looking up so search for that okay terrific yeah good Mm -hmm. yeah thanks yeah yeah absolutely that's exciting um okay so let's see uh oh well since you mentioned you talked earlier about your son graduated from high school and that being difficult for you and you mentioned that you talk about this in the book chapter I wonder if you have any Uh, advice or reflections or tips for other widowed parents who may be approaching that milestone of like you know, things they should keep in mind or you know things they might not be anticipating or whatnot um well I try not to I think sometimes in our widowed parenting we feel like we're waiting for the other shoe to drop and I don't want widowed parents to to do that like enjoy where you are with your kids, enjoy what's going on, enjoy how you're rebuilding your, your life and, and what you're making it out of this tragedy and, and look for the golden nuggets, like, and golden nuggets are those little tiny things that um, bring a smile to your face or, you know, make you realize that, wow, I'm doing this as a parent or wow, look at my kid and look at what they've done with the tragedy or any success that they have. Um, everybody worries about how the death is going to impact their kids. Um, It's a natural, it's a natural thing to do. You wouldn't be a good parent if you weren't worried about your kids, but don't let it win because remember at the beginning, I said, I don't even know what I fed my kid that first year. And he's now 21. He's in engineering. He's brilliant. My 18 year old daughter is, you know, setting the world on fire and she's brilliant. And somehow, somehow we did it. And I couldn't tell you the, the, the steps too, but we did it. And, and you guys can too. It's, it's no fun. It's hard, but it absolutely can be done and you're rocking it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Terrific. Well, you know, I was, I think you just answered what was going to be my last question. I always like to ask my guests, if you could say one thing to widowed parents, what would you say to them? But I think you may have just answered that. Yeah. It's, it's holding on to hope, right? And you might not know how you're going to get there or what it's going to look like, but just know that that grief does change. You'll figure it out. It's, it's no fun, but, um, and, and build your community, Bring, surround yourself with people that, that can support you and understand your grief in a, in a way that makes sense. I think that's a big thing that will help. Mm-hmm. Terrific. Well, I think that's a great place to end. 
So my guest today is Marnie Williams Belotis, co-founder and executive director of Hummingbird Center for Hope, which is in the Toronto area in Ontario, Canada. So Marnie, where can listeners find Hummingbird Center for Hope? Um, well, we're on social media, but also our website is uh, hummingbirdcenterforhope.com. And it's center, C-E-N-T-R-E, right? You got it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and I'll put a link in the show notes as well. Thanks. Terrific. Well, Marty, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Mm -hmm. It's been fun. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Marnie williams Belotis as much as I did. You can find show notes and all the links at widowedparentpodcast.com. Look for episode 90. And a great big shout out today to all my listeners in Canada. It's so great to have you guys here. Seems like I've talked to several people in Canada recently. I, um, well, let's see, on my live show, I interviewed Corey Sirota last week, I think it was, and... She is in Montreal and is involved in a, uh, an organization there called Myra's Kids Foundation, which has some children's grief camps and programs, um, as well as private practice working with grieving individuals and families. So, yeah, I talked with her last week and then, well, actually, I was on her radio show recently on a Montreal radio station as well. And I'm going to be interviewing another person in Canada later this month. And, uh, and then today, of course, I talked with Marnie. So all of my listeners in Canada, welcome. It's actually the second largest number of listeners after, of course, the, well, I'm in the U.S., so it makes sense that the largest number of listeners would be here. Uh, then after that, second largest number of listeners in Canada, followed by the UK and Australia, rounding out the top four. So very glad all of you are here. And Thank you for listening. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, um, please do remember to check out futurewidowbook.com. And from there, you can pre-order the Kindle version on Amazon. You can also request a free signed book plate, which I will send out when the book launches in January. And I'll send out a an, an, uh, note letting you guys know when the paperback or hardcover can be ordered as well. And I will be adding links there as soon as they are enabled. It's probably not going to be, it'll probably be um, a little closer to launch time, but where the books can be ordered from independent bookstores as well, either online or finding an independent bookstore near you. So lots of good things coming. i um, working on getting all that arranged right now. So um, I'm very glad you're here listening. And as always, thank you for listening. And until next week, keep smiling. Thank you for listening to the Widowed Parent Podcast with your host, Jenny Lisk. Connect with us on social media and at widowedparentpodcast.com.